Did my father know, when he started the book, that it would finish him? All those years of success, love from the audience. Did he know that one day the bill would be presented to Mr. Dickens? So there's a mystery. There's evidence and many questions. As for answers... One day, my dear, dear Edwin, the bill will be presented. Oh, but not today. Not tonight, Jack. If I'm not mistaken, there's dinner to be had tonight. <laughs> the lad's hungry. But lads always are. I'll take your coat off. Stand by the fire. You've no more than five years to pull on me for that lad, Jack. <laughs> so don't come at the old fella with this fella. And don't mollycoddle. I hate being mollycoddled. Well then, come on through and sit down. There's... Two young men, in fact, nephew and uncle, and John Jasper, choir master at the cathedral, does love to come at the fogey, whilst Edwin Drood, young Edwin, is a lover. Well, the boy is cheerful tonight. Ain't he? And what a spread. Someone's birthday, is it? <laughs> Not yours, that's for sure. <laughs> Drink up, I'll carve. Pour for yourself. Not mine, but... Rosa's! <laughs> Bumpers to Rosa. <laughs> Give me your hand, Jack, for it's Rose's birthday. With all my heart, my dear, dear boy. I wish the both of you the greatest happiness that creation may shower like gentle rain upon... But no, what is it? Sit, Jack, sit. It's nothing. It's something. I know you, my dear. Or nothing that may disturb a fine dinner. Let's drink again. Nine times nine and one to finish. To Rosa! To Rosa! Tough nuts to crack, Brazils. <laughs> Enough of that, Ed. Rosa, you see. I choose her above any other girl in the world, Jack. Then what are we talking about? If I had the choice, I'd choose her. But I don't, do you see? Nut. <clears throat> I eat the nut. I grant you there's a possible world in which the nut is not eaten, but it don't concern me. What is, is. Because my dead father and Rosa's dead father had his married in anticipation. Two orphans brought together... In love. Brought together because of their father's will, Jack. Your life is yours. You can eat as many nuts as you want, but I'll never know if if I act because I want to or I must. For you, life goes on steady, easy, settled. Ned, Ned. Jack, if, if I've upset you... I... Never in this world. Only you seemed for a moment... Nothing, really. Just a pain, an old pain that I've been taking medicine for. It comes and goes and... See, it goes... Thirty miles distant, and a few days in time from Cloisterham, John Jasper finds himself ascending the yawning heights of a tenement in London. Back again, lovey, my special dear. Shall I fill a few for you tonight? Just remember the pricey, eh? You say what? Come the morning, there's the bill to pay. The price for the medicine, dearie. Do you dream? Can you dream? You tell Princess Puffer which is the dream and which the waking. Take it. Take it. Grave, if you're sleeping, our body sleeping dead away. Who cares as long as who oh. pays, eh? Another, another, another. Why do we do it to ourselves, eh? Seek oblivion. Don't ask me, dearie. You're the professor, eh? Yeah. What are you talking about, woman? Is this thing to you that gabble away in your dreams? It's an education, ain't it, just? <laughs> Give me water, damn you. What gabble are you talking about? Words, ain't it? What words? <laughs> 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 
Careful, careful words. I'm, I'm just going to... Let me down, dearie. I'll, I'll mix you another. No one mixes like the princess. You ask old Mr Z, he'll tell you. <sighs> Long as you pays, this is your house. Oh, this rat heap mine. From cathedral to this. <laughs> So it drives you, eh? Yes, another, why not? Another mile to oblivion. Another, I said! You'll pay, you promise? I'll pay. I'll pay. Hey, you'll pay. You'll pay. But you see, Jack, you are respected. A lay presenter. What you've done with a choir, you're teaching. Why, Rosa says there never was such a music teacher as you. And never such a pupil, Ned, but I tell you, by God, sometimes it comes upon me like a black hound. All my music becomes frozen into cold stone like this damned cathedral I serve. I'll never say so, my dear fellow. Here, take my hand. Take hold. Don't drift away on the stream. I shall hang on to hope, then. As you to Rosa. See, I have the picture you made of her on the wall there. <laughs> well, I am a little proud of it. I think I caught something of her look, her spirit. Take care, Ned, or else we both may drift away upon the rising tide. Drink up, Jack. Port will set you right. <sighs> And I do love Rosa. Mm. And for all my fancies, in a year I'll carry her away from the Academy and we shall be Mr and Mrs Edwin Drood. And I shall go engineering into Egypt, and she with me. The Romans, you know, forbade travel to Egypt. They saw it as a land of mysteries, of sphinxes and crocodiles. I shall endeavour not to get eaten by a crocodile. <laughs> Though Rosa would be a tasty morsel to be snapped up on the banks of the Nile. Never say it, Ned. As for me... I fear that when you go, my life will... Ah, more port and nuts. But <clears throat> be warned. What is hidden will not be denied. The reckoning will be presented. Which reminds me, old fellow, if I slip away to present a parcel at the Academy for Rosa's birthday. As many pairs of gloves as she is years old today. I may not call, of course, at this time of night, but they should be there. Otherwise, the poetry don't quite work, you see. The following day, Edwin visits the Nuns House Academy for Young Ladies, under the direction of... Miss Twinkleton, how does the afternoon find you? Pretty much as you do yourself, Mr. Drood. Pleased to enter. You have come to see... Miss Bud. I hope her birthday was all that could be expected. Well, you may ask yourself, sir. She awaits thither. Thither? You mean your parlour as... Manners and custom decree. Deportment, Mr Drood. Then thither I go, Miss Twinkleton. Excuse me. Rosa, may I wish you were deferred, but nonetheless... What are you doing? Picking out notes, Eddie. What does it look like? But why, since you can play perfectly well, are you picking out notes so badly? It is not easy picking out notes with one's apron over one's head, Eddie. Manners did prompt me to forbear to mention it, but now that you have, as it were, broken the silence... Oh, do stop, Eddie. It's too ridiculous. Agreed. But I'm not the one with an apron over his head. Shall I go? No. The girls would all be asking why. Then please do... Take that thing off your head. There. And there you are. So beautiful. And there you are. So beautiful too. The two of us too beautiful for our own good, I dare say. I got the gloves last night. They are delightful. How was your birthday? Splendid, Eddie. Everyone gave me a present. We had a feast and a ball. Ah, oh. oh do forgive me. Tweezers. Left here somewhere. Tweezers. Mm. Ah, yes. Aha. Oh, carry on. Carry on. The proprietor wishes to ensure the proprieties are observed. A ball? <laughs> Any partners? We danced with each other, silly. 
Ah. Though some of the girls did make game to be their brothers. <laughs> Such fun. And did anyone make game... To be you? Mm, well, Isabella did. <laughs> really? Was she... Oh, excellent. Such saucy lips has Isabella. <laughs> but I would have nothing to do with him and he with me. His kisses were for others. Oh, do excuse me. <laughs> Spectacles. Mr. Trude, you are pale. Are you... A fresh air, Miss Twinkleton. We're about to go for a walk, if that may be permitted. Splendid. Fresh air. Deportment. Nothing like it. Don't forget your gloves. Now imagine, Eddie. You was you. I mean, the you you was last night. And I was no one in particular. You can't be no one, Rosa. For now, Eddie. And so I was to ask, is you engaged? Yes. Nice. Charming. Tall? Tolerably. See, not like me at all. A classical nose, I expect. Yes, ish. Big then. Tolerably too. Hmm. Not given to fences. Sensible. And this sensible woman likes the idea of being carried off to Egypt, does she? She has an sensible interest in the triumphs of engineering that are to be engineered there. To wit, she don't hate boilers and things. Boilers? No. Things? Who can say? No oh, things. Things! Rosa, let's be friends. I... I wish we could be friends, but don't you see, it's because we can't that we try each other so. We might both have been happier if what is supposed to be had been left as what might have been. Rosa, I'm not that clever outside of my line. I'm not sure I'm that clever in it, but I want to do the right thing. There's not, I mean, anyone else. No, Eddie. Just the thing. The endless thing like stones, like the cathedral there. Out of the past that will not let us go. They're practicing for Evensong. I think I can even hear Jack's voice. Take me back now, dear Eddie. I don't want to be here when they come out. Hurry. Hurry. Where? Oh, where are you now, John? What do you say, Princess? Thou yeah. shalt not steal an empty feet, and tis so lucrative to cheat. <laughs> You're not cheating me, dearie. Not your own sweet Princess Papa. I'm done with you. Do you hear? Finished. <laughs> Not done with me, you ain't. There's a darkness waiting for you, dearie. Over those last months, as my father was getting deeper into the mystery of Edwin Drood, there was a sort of frenzy about him. As if he knew there was too much to get done before, well, simply too much to discover or hide. He crossed the country by rail, performing night after night, sometimes coming home, sometimes going elsewhere. By Jove, Septimus, that was brisker than a half. Some might say swimming in the weir come Christmas is a fool's choice, but the Reverend Septimus Grisparkle is an athlete. Even so, he sprints home at a pretty smart pace. Step it up, Septimus. Step it up. All the way back to the house on Minor Cannons Row, he shares with... Septimus! Morning, Ma. Briskin, ain't it? There's a letter and breakfast on the table. A letter, Ma? 
As you see, Septimus, says the old lady fondly, as one might to a slightly bumbling son, though Septimus is, in fact, anything but that. Why don't you read it, Ma? Your eyes are still pretty sharp, eh? And I'd attend to the eggs and toast. It's from, says she, Mr Honeythunder. Oh, oh don't groan. He is a good and... Philanthropic. Gentleman who has sheltered many an orphan. And don't he let you know it? Now, now, Septimus. He says the society is sending us... A present. <gasps> oh, capital eggs, Ma. That you are to prepare yourself to receive... Neville Landless. And this is... Someone who can talk for herself. <laughs> Helena Landless. And you are? Chris Buck, Reverend Septimus. Interesting name. We are the delivery from Honey Thunder and Go. Does uh, anyone have a sensible name anymore? Please forgive my brother. <laughs> He's an unmannerly brute. We are pleased to meet you, Mr. Chris Barker. And are you, Miss Landless? Mr. Neville? Do you have... Uh, only what we carry. We are truly landless. <laughs> or possessionless. Well, let me carry those bags. A bit heavy for a... <laughs> Not for a boxer, Mr. Neville. Yeah. Follow me, if you please. What are we doing here, Helly? What we're told, I suppose, until we may do what we want. Hmm? Living on bloody charity. Come along, please. There is a warm house and tea awaiting. Please, sit down, both of you. As you know... We know very little, I'm afraid. Yeah. Mr. Honey Thunder. Mm, not given to confidences, sir. Hmm. Then I must inform you that you, Miss Landless, are to lodge with the young ladies of the Academy under the guidance of Miss... Uh, Twinkleton. <laughs> Neville? And your brother is to lodge here, where he will study for uh, his career. Neville, what have you to say? Hmm? Uh, well, it seems we have no choice. So, Reverend, I thank you for your friendship and hospitality. It has been a cold enough season for us in London, but I feel that here in Cloisterham, we shall find better friends, if not former weather. Well, that is handsome of you, Mr. Neville, and we will try to live up to it. Please, my young friend, set to. Yeah. But you say the weather... Uh, my uh, brother and I were brought up in Ceylon, Reverend, by our stepfather after our mother died. By a brute. Surely, Mr. Neville. No, I tell you, it was as well he died when he did, or I would have killed him for sure. Sir. Easy, Neville. But, but he speaks the truth. That man used me badly. He beat her. More than once. The damned coward. Beat her and enjoyed it. I am shocked, Neville. I... I don't know what to say. Mm -mm. You say you are a boxer, Reverend. A noble art, but there was nothing noble about that man, I tell you. When we came to this country, we came cold and angry. And we were determined to admit no kindness. We planned to quarrel with you from the start and cast you all off and go our own way, but uh, well, I would not speak for Helena. But I will speak for myself. We like you, Reverend. <laughs> You're a new thing for us. You are what you are, and... If you will be our friend, we will try to be yours. Just grant us a little leeway for kindness has not been our friend up to now. Well, I say that's damned, excuse my language, handsome of you both, and I shall do my part. And to begin, I say, come the weekend, let us have a small party here where you can meet some friends of mine so you do not feel too alone. But of course, Miss Helena, you will know Miss Bard, for she too is a boarder at the establishment of Miss Twinkletoes. <laughs> Twinkleton. <laughs> <laughs> And we are to share, Miss Landless. I do hope that will be... I'm sure it will be perfect, Miss Bard. Oh, and do call me Rosa. Miss Bud sounds like a maiden aunt. And you shall call me Helena. You mustn't mind Miss Twinkleton either, Helena. She means well and does care for us. Here we are, my little room like a crow's nest at the very top of the house. Have you ever been on a ship, Helena? Oh, your box is here. I shall help you unpack. 
I came to England on a ship, Rosa dear, and in a crow's nest too, at the top of the main mast. But however did you? Simply slipped on a pair of sailor's ducks and a shirt, and up I swarmed like a monkey. Oh. Oh. Well, it must have been... Tremendous. <laughs> I could see for miles, and there they all were shouting up at me to come down, because being a female, I should surely fall to my death at any instant. Oh, you are very brave, Helena. I should never dare. Ah, oh, I was a little savage as a child. <laughs> often ran away in war breaches more than a skirt, no matter how often my stepfather beat me for it. Gosh, I wish you had been here last week. We had a party for my birthday and a dance. No boys, of course. So some of the girls pretended to be their brothers, but if you had been there, I would have danced with you all night. <laughs> you are very sweet, Rosa, but do you not have an admirer? I do. Eddie. Hmm. Uh, Edwin. Mr. Drood. Well, at least I am to be Mrs. Drood. We are to be Mr. and Mrs. Drood. Hmm... I'm thinking there's a long mile between are to be and want to be. No, Eddie's a good man. Truly he is. Oh, the bell to late tea and prayers. Shall we go down? Uh, prayers? Oh, you're not a heathen, Helena. Do say you're not. Not at all. I'm a believer. At least in the Reverend Chris Barkle. The other brands of charity I've met have pleased me less. Well, you shall meet dear Eddie at the Reverend's this Saturday night, for we are to have a little party, I am told. Mr Jasper will play the piano. Mr Jasper? Eddie's uncle. Oh, a young uncle. And my music teacher. He... 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 Eddie's very fond of him. Mm. And you? And I shall introduce you to the other girls. <laughs> Come along, ladies. The punctuality is next to... And as the days turn, and Septimus Crisparkle takes his daily swim by the weir... Yeah. Chilly, sir. Oh, decidedly chilly. Let us hope... Sighing by me, cooling my fevered brow, the stream of flowers as ever. Yet, Alice, where art thou? One year back this even, and thou wert by my side. One year back this even, and thou wert by my side. He hopes that the young folk, as he thinks of them, will find comradeship between them at his little soiree. They gather. John Jasper plays and Rosa Budd sings. Do let me stop. It is too, too much. Oh, come now, Rosa, my dear girl. It is merely a song. A set of words that you sing with great feeling. Do not disappoint your admirers. Come, old girl. Jack's right. You've a lovely voice. Might be a bit of a tired old song, but really... Now, I would have thought it plain that Miss Budd does not wish to sing any more. Enough? Rosa, my dear, come, sit down, and a moment will see you well again. Hmm? Oh, I'm such a goose. I'm sorry. Well, Ned, if Rosa will not, shall you sing for us? I wouldn't want to bother the company with my voice, Jack. What about Mr Landless? Are you a singer, sir? No, sir, I am not. And I would have thought Miss Rosa would prefer a little quiet. <laughs> I'm sure Miss Bud will be right in a trice. Uh, some tea, perhaps? I think... Reverend, it is uh, approaching the time Miss Twinkleton asked us to return. Yeah. Propriety, you know, is the soul of... Um... Boredom. Society, surely, Mr Landless. Well said, Ned. But one must always make allowances for the artistic temperament. Ah, I ask for no allowances, sir. <laughs> and I am no artist. Oh, that talent lies with you. I hear you are the choir master here. I am. And must be on my way, too. Chris Sparkle, a fine afternoon. Ah. I go. Ladies, it was a pleasure to share your company. Hmm. Rosa, I shall walk you back. And Neville shall walk me. Hmm. Reverend, 
thank you for your thought, <gasps> your care, and your remarkably fine crumpets. Oh, <laughs> they alone were worth the journey from the east. <laughs> We'll let the boys go on ahead, shall we? I think we are safe. I feel safe with you, Helena. Cloisterham is your town. These are your streets. I feel that I have come to a good place with you, Rosa. I feel very young beside you. <laughs> Cherish it, my dear. I wish I had ever known what it means to feel that. I seem to have always been in opposition to something, whilst you can't even sing a sentimental song without tears. <laughs> and yet, my pretty one, there is a fascination in you. I wish Eddie felt so. Surely he must love you with all his heart. I suppose he does. It's probably my fault. I should be nicer to him, and yet it's all so ridiculous. We're always quarrelling. Why? Because it's so ridiculous. Then let it be so. But we shall be friends. I do hope so. I want a friend who understands me. And Mr. Jasper? He is not your friend? He seemed very concerned with you tonight. What do you mean? He seemed to follow your lips as you sang, looking at you and not the keys or the music. Intent. Very intent. From you to your Eddie and from Eddie to you. Ah, like a metronome. Tick tock, tick tock. Oh, don't. It's as if a ghost, a ghost were walking. I. Oh, hold me, Helena. Hush now. Hush. You don't like him, Jasper? Sometimes his eyes wander away and he seems to be lost in some frightful sort of dream. And when he smiles to reassure me already, more terrible than ever. Hold me. Stay with me. Hush now. Hush, sweeting. Never fear. Never fear. My father was worried. If I'm to be honest, as the book progressed, or did not, I began to believe that he was frightened, even terrified. He talked of plot and character and suspense, and did not, could not talk of what terrified him. Perhaps he allowed his characters to be open as he could not. Ten of a brisk morning, some days after the Reverend Chris Barkle soiree, Two young men meet by chance in town. Mr. Landless, good day to you. And to you, Mr. Drood. A fine prospect. I beg your pardon? The cathedral, the castle. Yeah, I'm sure. Do you enjoy it for long? Up and down between here and town, then next year, well, a little up and down before I'm off to Egypt with... Mm, so you are not studying for anything? No more schoolboy stuff for me. Us engineers like to get our hands oily. Whilst you, I believe, are reading for the law exams at the Good Reverence. He is a decent man. Oh, and he told me of your other good fortune. Pray enlighten me. Your betrothal to Miss Budd. Which appears to be the talk of the marketplace. I apologize, but if your good fortune... is hardly to be a topic of common chatter. I thought you would be proud of so... Well, I am a practical man, not a scholar like you, and it don't do in our world for a fellow to go around boasting of what he is most proud. It seems to me inconsiderate to talk so of someone whose circumstances you do not know. Best to keep it buttoned, Mr. Landless. Now, where I come from, sir, you would answer for that. Any time. <laughs> boys! Boys! We must have no more of this. These are high words, I hear. Ned, Mr. Neville is a stranger, and you should, nay, must, respect the laws of hospitality. Mr. Landless, you will pardon me, but I must say, govern your temper. There they stand, these three. A frozen moment. And best if they parted now and never saw each other the more. But Edwin takes a breath. So far as I'm concerned, Jack, 
There is no anger in me. <laughs> Nor in me. I own that my history makes me touchy and... Uh... Good. Now, please me again by taking a glass in friendship in my rooms. As the three leave, an omnibus deposits a passenger at the stop. An elderly gentleman with a lawyer's bag who makes his way to... Mr. Grugis to see Miss Bud. The Academy. Mr. Grugis looks like a lawyer, walks with the solemnity of a lawyer, and yet is still, heart, liver and lights, a decent man. My dear Miss Bud, my dear Rosa, I have kept you waiting. Will you forgive an old man? Always and forever, sir. Thank you for coming. How should I not? You were given into my care by your dear mother, as she... Miss Twinkleton pops in. Ah, oh, ah, oh, scissors. I do believe. Mr. Grugius, how pleasant to see you. Well, do make yourself at... Do you care for... Uh, no tea. Thank you, Mum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sit down, sit down, do. <clears throat> First, if I may offer salutations upon your birthday, my dear young woman... <laughs> We bid careless girlhood farewell. Farewell indeed. But I find you well. You do, sir. Glad of it. Now, as you come to your last year at Miss Twinkleton's... Oh. Oh, Mum. Needle case. Oh, please don't disturb yourselves. Come and gone. At your service. And so to Mr Edwin, who has been to and fro here, as arranged... He has. And in your letters to me, you mentioned that you like him and he likes you. I like him well enough, sir. Splendid. Uh. Yes? No, please go on. And that upon reaching the age of 18, you will come into the lump sum of £1,700, as laid down in your father's will, from which the cost of your marriage may be at any time... May I ask you something, Mr. Grugis? Of course. So, my poor papa and Eddie's father were firm friends, and made an agreement that Eddie and I might be firm friends also. You put it admirably. For our lasting good and happiness? Exactly. But we are not bound by it. Our inheritance is not tied to that friendship, if you see what I mean. No forfeiture on either side, should there be no marriage? In short, this betrothal is a wish, a sentiment, a, a hope. Indeed, when you were children, both in my wardship, you grew accustomed to it, and it has prospered, as we see. As we see. Of your own free will and attachment, for your mutual happiness. Otherwise, null and void. Now, are there any instructions I may take from you for your affairs? I think I should like to settle things with Eddie first, if you have no... Uh, uh, no objection at all. <laughs> I am and always will be in this world, my dear Rosa, at your service. And fate, never loath to point out an infinity of choice for those of us resident upon this terraqueous globe, is yet at her work in John Jasper's chambers, pulling a thread here, Laying in a pattern there. Ah, you recognise the picture of Miss Bud? I do, though it is far from flattering to the original. Oh, you're hard on it. It was done by Ned, who'd made me a present of it. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, Mr. Drood. If I had known I was in the artist's presence... Oh, it was merely a sketch. To take a moment, a fleeting image. One day I will paint her. If she's a good girl. <laughs> oh, capital couch, Jack. Though the springs are going, I fear. Uh, that's because you lounge upon it so, Ned. Look at him, Mr Neville. Thinks he's already the Sultan of Egypt. I dare say. Now, Landless, if you were to paint a picture of your lady love... I can't paint. Oh, I'm sure you would if you could. Would you make her Minerva? Juno, Venus? I have no lady love, Drood. Well, if I were to try my hand upon your sister, you would see what I can do. I'm sure very well. More sherry? But you'd need Helena's permission, and that mm. you would never get. 
She's not one to waste her time lounging around being painted. I shall just have to bear the loss. I'm sure the loss would be mine. There he sits, all before him, a golden lad. Whereas you and I, Mr. Landless, are merely chimney sweepers, grinding away day by day. You make me feel quite guilty, Jack. It might have done Mr. Drood some good to have known some hardships. Oh. Why? Yes, why? Because it might have made him more sensible that good fortune is not always due to his own merits. And have you? What? Known misfortune? I have. And what landless has it made you sensible of? Gentlemen. I told you this morning, unless you would prefer I keep it buttoned. <laughs> you said, I believe, that I would answer to you were we in that part of the world where you come from, yes? Yes. Fortunately, it is a long way away. Here then, now, you damn braggart. Enough. Ned, stand down. Mr. Neville, you too. <laughs> stand down. I, I'll stand down. For now. <laughs> That is a very angry young man. Hmm. Mr. Grugius has another commission before he returns to his offices in London. He awaits an appointment at the Traveller's Inn, where he puts up when he visits Cloisterham. Ah, my dear boy. I'm sorry I'm late, sir. I was unavoidably detained. You seem a little high in colour, Edwin. I hope nothing is wrong. Oh, no matter, sir. A rude fellow, that is all. Then, I have booked a private room, and there we must talk together. I place this box before you. It contains a ring. A rose of diamonds and rubies set in gold. It belonged to Rosa's mother. It was removed from her dead hand in my presence. You see how bright the jewels are. A hundred times so were her eyes. It is almost cruel that the stones live on and she... It was removed by her grieving husband, who, when his time came so cruelly soon, passed it to me. That it be put upon Rosa's finger by her betrothed. And so I pass it to you, Edwin Drood. I charge you. Bring past and present together. Sir, I... I will do as you... But should you feel in the smallest part that you act under the charge of the past and not from your own heart, then bring that ring back to me. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I, I do. Night in the city, and a wanderer amongst the tombs of the ancient churchyard, where Mr. Durdles, the cathedral stonemason, keeps an uneasy watch. Who goes there? I oh, say, who goes there? Come out, damn you. Of a ten pound club, I'm here. Uh, Mr. Durdles, uh, spare my skull, I might need it. Oh, Mr. Jasper, there you are. Solid as me and no ghost neither. You haven't forgot? You promised to show me the Undercroft and the Tower for my book. No, I can't say as I holds with books, but, um... <clears throat> is that a bottle you've got in your basket there? Prime pork, Durdles, and you does hold with that, I've no doubt. <clears throat> oh. oh, that's the right stuff. <clears throat> ah, there's an itch to it, no. Right, shall we go? I'll have a lantern, if you've the eyes to see. I'll take care at the bottom. Now, there's lime for mortar stalled. Don't you get none of it on you, mister, or it'll eat your skin away and you'll just be one more skeleton down here with the rest of them. Yeah, ever get lost down here, though? Me? Oh, never. But I hear things. Howls and cries in the dark. Ghosts. Oh, ain't only what's been. There's ghosts, mister, now. Come along. It's a hike in the tower at the end of it. Ah, oh, master of all your surveys from up here, eh? Ain't you, Mr. Jasper? 
A man who's not master of himself is master of nothing, Mr. Dartles. Oh, that going in your book? How about some more pork going in me, and then we're done? Is that a boy I see down there? <laughs> Ain't it just? <laughs> You're late. You're drunk. Your missus ain't going to be pleased. Get along, you old... Oh, well, back off, deputy. I'm going. I'm going. Well, you now, Help. you damned Ooh. baby devil. Who asked you, Mr Whiskers, and... Yeah. Oh. You, boy, have been following us. Uh. Answer me. No, leave him be, mister. He's only doing his job. Following me is not his job. Let me go. Let me go, Miss I wasn't following no one honest. No, I pays him to drive me home when I was late and drunk. It's true, Mr Whiskers. I throw stones to drive him home. Catches him out after ten. Witty witty why? Then I'll pick up a stone and shy. Then take him home. And boy, if you ever see me again, anywhere, any time, any place, make sure I don't see you. Or by God, it'll be the last thing you ever see. Was my father pushing himself? Or was something driving him? Charles Dickens had written many ghost stories of characters driven by regret and guilt from the past. But what if now he was writing a ghost story of a man haunted by the future? Sometimes, in the flaring yellow light of the gas lamps, sometimes his face looked... looked... as if he were already dead. In Cloisterham, Mr Edwin Drood is visiting... Good morning, Miss Twinkleton. Mr Drood for... Miss Bard. She's just putting on her bonnet and will be with you in a trice. A Merry Christmas to you, Mum. All the girls have gone home. It's very empty. Just the orphans left, me and Helena. Do you like her? Oh, she's splendid, Eddie. She's had all sorts of adventures. Really, she's like an adventure story, only... Only... Shall I pour? That's not what I want to talk about today. Me neither, Rosa. Two sugar lumps? Thank you. I thought... I want to say something very serious to you, Eddie. I've been thinking about it for a long time. Yes. I want to be serious too, Rosa. Serious and earnest. And we won't quarrel, will we, Eddie? Because we have so many reasons to be friends. Especially so at this time of year. We do? Like... brother and sister? Yes, like brother and sister. And never to be man and wife. Never. You just gave me six sugar lumps, Rosa dear. Oh, sorry. And I'm sorry too. And we've been sorry for many, many months, years perhaps, and never said, but now... We have. We could so easily have let it happen, and that would have been so wrong to have lived a life that wasn't ours at all. I think that cup is more sugar than tea by now. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I shouldn't laugh. Shall I ask for another cup? I shall take my medicine. Oh! <laughs> Might I have another cup? No milk, no sugar. <laughs> I shall have to tell Jack. It will be a blow to him. He must be told, I suppose. Who else if not Jack? I'm going to write to Mr. Grugius. After all, he is my guardian. He will be dreadfully disappointed, but... It must be done. Perhaps he could tell Mr. Jasper. I am... I admit, Rosa, very tempted, but I feel that if I can find the moment, the very right moment, in many ways Jack is strong, but there is something there I fear for. Some darkness in his soul. Some secret. If there is a way to tell him, to say what must be said, then surely 
it must be from me. The Reverend Septimus Chris Sparkle walks by the river, composing a sermon to be given in this season of Christ's birth. Let us think about this stable where Joseph and Mary found succor, rest for the night. Yes, plain is better. A straight right fist to the chin. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a right hand. I'll have to stay out of your reach, Mr. Chris Parker. Oh, my dear friends, I am so sorry. I never meant for... Oh, we never thought you did. A wild enough evening for your walk, Miss Landless. You don't find it too cold with the weather driving in from the sea? We love the wildness, sir. It answers something in my own heart. I think in Eleanor's too. When there were storms in Salon and everyone went undercover, I went out and was often punished for it. But to be in the eye of the storm, oh, that's something indeed. Hmm? It seems, my friends, that uh, you have led me to where I must be. Um... Nev? Uh, you refer to my uh, conversation with Mr. Drood the other day. Ah, there has been some talk of it at the Academy. Hot words were exchanged. I believe it barely stopped short of blows. Had not Mr. Jasper intervened, and then later, at his rooms, high words again. It is unfortunate. Not least because it has given rise to a prejudice against him in the town, that he is a, a passionate, even dangerous fellow. That is not fair, sir. Yes, I know it. You know it. Your sister knows it, but the world, Mr. Neville, thinks otherwise. And as far as opinion goes, the world has it. Well... They'll be shot of me come Christmas. I have a stout stick, good boots, a backpack, and intend to walk the country hereabouts for the holiday. A good idea, but you will be back and... Look. Listen to the Reverend Neville. This quarrel must be mended. But then let Mr. Drew... The hot words, the clenched fist was yours. True, but the narrow looks and the hypocrisy were his. The world saw you, and you must play the man. If I could do it from my heart, but I cannot, I won't be a hypocrite. Is the difference, Reverend, between a great spirit and a base one? That man Drood is... You too, Miss Helena? How do you come to say this? You'd best come out with it now. Uh, it is hard to say, but I should have said it before. I am sorry, sir. I... I admire Miss Rosa Bud sir, to, to so great an extent that I cannot bear to see her treated like a, like a doll, a toy, a, a thing, as she is by Edwin Drood. There, Helly, it's said now. Great God above. Uh, who knows this? Only the three of us who stand here now. Miss Bud is your friend. She is my friend, but she knows nothing. And consider, she is to be married to... That man I know, and it burns me to my heart. Listen to me, <sighs> Neville. It cannot be. Not in this world. You know that. God help me, I do. You have to make up with Drood. Or do you wish to destroy Miss Bard in, in pursuit of this... This... The madness. <sighs> Your words. And I will speak to Jasper. See if he cannot invite you and Edwin Drood to dinner on Christmas Eve, when you will shake his hand and wish him well and declare all enmity between you over. I do not ask for more than that. Hear him, Nev. If you love Rosa, then you must let her go to her marriage. Oh, then uh, if it must be, I... It must. The afternoon winds its chilly way towards evening and leads Edwin Drood on a solitary path. He walks by the old castle, misses its scenic qualities entirely, considers measuring the height of the cathedral tower by trigonometry, but decides not to. Looks at the time and discovers that his repeater watch is not ringing the last quarter properly when he presses the bezel. And so, Mr. Trude, is it not, pops into a convenient jeweler's. Do I see a very fine double hunter by, oh, Voidship, if I'm not mistaken. A repeater? Engraved case? Yes, it was my father's and... Ah. Um... The chimes. And not sounding the quarter, 
when I... If I may. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. But, yes, yes, this does occur sometimes. A clean, no more. I can do it as you wait, sir. Please. I hope I'm not taking any undue advantage. But I met Mr Jasper the other day and he mentioned a happy event. Um, well... Oh, say nothing, say nothing. I only wondered if, well, at such times, jewellery is always acceptable for you, for the lady. I'm afraid I wear no jewellery apart from the watch and a shirt pin. They were both left to me by my late father. Uh, Of course, of course. But perhaps the other party, the lady concerned, rings and such like? That is likewise taken care of, you might say. Well, here it is done. Dust is the enemy of fine work. If you'll press the bezel, it should now sound the last quarter of an hour. And now, on the darkest night, you will not be without the comfort of time, if time is ever comfortable. Uh, two shillings and sixpence, Mr Drood, if you'll be so kind. And if you would be so kind, madam, I have a ring. I would be interested in your opinion. Oh. Ah. Mm. 17th century gold. Look at the depth. Diamonds, rubies, mm, two tin, possibly. Yes, it is very fine. Is there a history? I don't know. You see, all fine pieces have a story. They are freighted with the lives they were part of. Perhaps happy, but perhaps not. Price. I would not offer less than a thousand guineas, but obviously not the sale. Rings are made to be worn. Otherwise, they have no purpose. Thoughtfully, Edwin leaves the shop and continues his solitary walk. Rings are made to be worn. He stops. People are crossing the street to keep well away from an old woman, raggedy dressed, but with a a certain faded finery, as if somewhere, somehow, she is someone else entirely. Are you sick? Can I help you? Not sick. Blind? Oh, sir, if you could see as well as me. Are you lost, homeless? Can I help? I'm your life and your wife. Uh, what? Sir? I'm sorry, ma'am. You reminded me of someone I seem to know. Ma'am? Oh, it's been an age since anyone called me that. God bless you, sir. Where are you going? Where are you going, sir? Desolation Row? (laughs) I go to London. Why are you here, then? I'm looking for a needle in a needle stack, sir. For a man with no name but I saw. (laughs) You saw... Mm. What? Do you take opium? Three shillings and sixpence, if you please, sir, and the princess will lay it out for you. Is that the fair to London? All's fair in love and war, and the sun will tell you that only in war will you find love. Oh, love lost me today. No, maybe I'm lying. Lost me long ago. Here, is this enough? Mm, More than enough, my dear. A ticket. Enough for a ticket? I saw a ticket when he forked over the rhino, and I come looking, but now I has to go back. <coughs> What's your name, dearie? Um, uh, Edwin. Why? God bless you and keep you, Edwin, but, you know, I reckon that given his record, he won't. <laughs> And at the other end of the same street, two men meet, Septimus Crisparkle and John Jack Jasper. It is up to us, Mr Jasper. I agree, to see amity between these two young fellows. I will talk with Edwin. And I with Neville. It will be a good thing if we can bring it off. The good men do is often turred with their bones. With bones enough in this precinct. Let's make a better world for these young men. I would go a long mile for Neville Landless. And I to the ends of the earth for dear Ned. (laughs) 
Another town. Another audience. He sits on a chair backstage, exhausted. He might be asleep. It seems as if everything that drives him now is driving him to destruction. Then his eyes spring open and another evening, another chapter. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Charles Dickens. And he walks out there like a man half his age to give them a Christmas carol. Whilst in Cloisterer, a meeting is settled. Mr. Jasper! Jasper! The very man I was seeking. Good day to you, Reverend. How does the season find you? Busy. As no doubt you are busy too. Busy, yes, but somehow... Oh, I wish sometimes the choir could perform something new, but no, the same old, same old. It is the season for home and heart, to be merry and not novel. Happy Christmas, sir. In Cloisterham, it is never the season for novelty. <laughs> but to the matter in hand, we talked. Yeah, we agreed these two young men must be brought together. Or I fear ill may come of it. I hope no more than ill feeling. And I tell you, man, I fear for more. I wrote as much in my diary. You begin to worry me, sir. No, no, my friend. Be reassured. I am the bearer of better news this season. I knew you would do it, Jasper. And the dear young fellow this morning. Jack, I, I am touched, touched by your, by your account, account of your, your meeting, meeting with Mr. Chris Barkle. Barkle. A good man. And, and I, I will say openly, I forgot myself quite as much as Mr. Landless. My wish is for all to be right again. And so, let us three dine on Christmas Eve. The better the day, the better the deed. And we shall shake hands, hands all, all round and say no more about it. And time ticks round to the evening. And your plans for the season, Neville? Walking. Mm. Walking? Here, port for you, gentlemen. Back in Ceylon, my sister and I would take long hikes into the forest or go climbing mountains, not always with our guardian's knowledge. <laughs> but uh, it seems to me that to know a place, you need to know it through your boots. Well, I drink to that, Neville. But, and I to you, Edwin. Your hiking sounds like Septimus Chris Sparkle. Oh, he's a great hiker, but he tells me I need to get into training before I can keep up with him. I'm a bit of a boxer too, I believe. Mm, boxing, swimming... I'd lay money on his taking a dip in the river Christmas morning. It's a bit of a custom of his, I recall. <laughs> I'll be sorry to miss it, but uh, I'll be well away by then. You? I shall take lunch with Miss Bad and Miss Landless at the Academy. Your sister will miss you, Neville. Ah, she says good riddance. Oh, but I must be away, my friends, if I'm to start early. <laughs> <laughs> I'll walk with you, if I may. If we go by way of the weir, there'll be some fine dramatic scenes with this wind. I only hope it's passed by morning. My seaweed assures me it will. And so, I must say good night to my dear friends. And so I must give my thanks to you, Mr. Jasper. I think nothing of it, man. And indeed do you too, Edwin. I know we shall be fast friends in future, Neville. Coats, hats, mufflers and scarves. Go on down, Neville. I'll catch you up. Then, good night, Mr. Jasper, and thank you again. You did a good thing, Jack. He's still a bear, but not so bad a bear as I thought. <laughs> I'll slip back after I've walked Neville home. There's a thing or two I must tell you. Tell me now. Save the walk. Later, my dear old Jack. Later. Midnight. And time, that cruel master, ticks on to Christmas morning. Chris Barkle! Are you there? Answer the door, man! For God's sake, Mr. Jasper, think of... What is it? My nephew. Edwin, is he with you? Why on earth would he be with me? Come in, man. 
tell me. He was to come back last night after he left with Mr. Landless. He didn't. I... I thought... Well, young men can be thoughtless, but he didn't come this morning. He was to be at the early service and... He overslept. Young men do that No, all the time. I ask that his lodgings, they had not seen him. He was not there. Where is he? Where is Neville Landless? They were together. Call him. For the love of God, call him, man. He isn't here. He left early this morning. He's on a walk. How walk. was he? What was his manner? He was gone by the time I... Jasper, what are you saying? After the storm, the weather is fine. A crisp, clear Christmas day. A good day for a young man to be walking through the Garden of England in its winter coat, navigating from church spire to church spire, as travellers have for centuries. Left or right, high road or long. Stop! Stop there, sir! Who are you to tell me to stop? We is the wedding ones telling you to stop. Four of you in the way. Thieves, are you? Well, I've nothing for you except my stick, my fists and my boots. I am four behind, boy, so you best do as you're told. <laughs> By damned thieves, I don't think so. Thieves at midday? I don't think so, lad. Then, what's your business? Best be quiet, Joe. Who says so? Eight against one. <laughs> Very well. If you want trouble... I'm not afraid to dish it up. Well, you don't do it. The violence ain't going to do you no good at all. Oh, I'll do it. And be damned to you. Damn you. Let me go. Let me... Easy, easy, lad. Got you in a wrestling hole. Yeah, champion at the wrestling is Joseph there. No, you don't get free till you come down. We mean you no harm. It's Frank all right, isn't he? Uh, nasty bruise, well, that's all. Oh, the boy can swing a stick. Now, if I let you up, will you come peaceable? What do you mean, man? All right. All right. Let me up. Uh, wipe his face, someone has blood on it. God, Joe, don't know your own strength. <laughs> uh, come along with us now. Tell me. You know, I think it best, lad, for your own good. If you don't say nothing until you find your friend at the crossroad. Here he is, gentlemen. Sit down, lad. You can say all you want. Where is Edwin? Where is Edwin? Why do you ask me? Because you are the last person to be with him, and he is not to be found. Uh, not to be found? Uh, stay, Jasper, stay. Uh, Neville, I know it's confusing. Take a moment. I, I don't understand. This is very important. I want you to answer my questions. What time did you leave Mr. Jasper's chambers last night? Uh, uh, just after nine. Uh, the cathedral clock had... Uh... Was Edwin Drood with you? Yes. And as Mr. Jasper has said, you were going down to the river together? D to see the wind, the storm, yes. Edwin said it would be a sight to see. How long were you there? Thirty minutes or so. Edwin played the half on his repeater, then we walked back to your house and he left me at the door. Yes, I was at late service. And Edwin Drood, did he say if he was going back to the river, or...? I, I think he had a message, something to deliver. I imagine to Miss Bud at the academy. There's blood. Blood on his stick. He carried it last night. Neville! In the name of everything sane, look, look at that fellow there. I hit him. He did. Fetched him an A-maker, he did, the boy. That means Drew. nothing. Calm yourself, Mr. Jasper. We must go back, do you see, Neville, to sort this out. You must clear yourself. Clear myself? Where is Edwin Drood? What have you done? Cloisterham. The local justice is rooted out of his Christmas jollities, and in a cold chamber, the first matter is decided. I can think, sir, of no reason why my nephew Edwin Drood should simply leave without a word. He wouldn't return to the river after walking with Mr. Landless to his house. So where would he go? What would he do? Return to his lodgings, surely. And that we know he did not do. Mm, this case has a dark look about it. Yeah, I can assure you that... Are you English, sir? Your colouring... Oh, for goodness sake. 
I have lived abroad. Hmm. Very well. And I feel that due to the serious nature of this matter, I should issue a committal to imprison... Sir, little is known, nothing is proven. It is a cold season to be in jail. I will undertake to continue lodging the young man in my house, where my mother dwells. I will offer surety for his behavior, and will undertake to produce him when and wherever the authorities require. Surely, if our suspicions are true, the young man is a desperate character and cannot be trusted. But the Reverend Chris Sparkle can. He is a clergyman of the Church of England. I so issue an order to that effect. We are done here. As Christmas Day wanes, two figures make their way along the riverbank. The sunset promises to be golden, draping the world with a late radiance neither man feels. Are you sure about this, Wigger? Very cold evening. Clear day like this is always chilly nights. If you can hold the rope, Joe, I can swim. I do most days, whatever the weather, and <laughs> rather you than me. Never liked the weir, never did. Seemed too bad he took my tires. Well, pray that I find nothing, Joe. <laughs> ah! I'm not up after a count of 200. All like hell. Yes, like the Devil Riv. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Neville, I am sorry I kept you waiting. No, sir, not at all. I am more than grateful to you. Mr. Jasper would have seen me in jail. That man hates me. I would swear it. And yet, last night, he was my friend. I would have sworn that too. I have been writing to my sister. She sent a note, begged me to see her, but I cannot. I do not want to bring more trouble upon her. She tells me that Miss Rosa is... Well, the poor woman is distracted, but believes in me. Neville, I say I am sorry to have kept you waiting because I was elsewhere occupied. Uh, sir? Mm, the river. At the weir. You know I swim, whatever the weather. I swam, Neville. I swam down into the mud and by the sluice I found a ring and a watch. A repeater watch. It stopped, but the chime still works, believe it or not. It sounds the three-quarter past nine o'clock. How did it get there? Neville, I ask you, who was at the weir last night with Edwin Drood at nine o'clock? Before the performance, sometimes he sits on the stage in the empty theatre. Charles Dickens awaits his audience. He knows they are the blank canvas on which he's going to paint his picture. Oliver Twist, Davy Copperfield. They are his past, but waiting in the shadows to come is Edwin Drood haunting him. A half year has gone by. No charges have yet been brought against Neville. At Chris Barkle's advice, he has moved to London. You're pale, Neville. I want to see the sun shining on you. To be honest, sir, I can't bear to be out in the daylight. I walk at night where no one can see me. I wish I had the courage just to... Hush, man. You've had enough to cope with. I? The murderer? The killer? The way they look at me across the street? That's I... Cloisterham. And that's why you're in London now. 10,000 faces and not the one who knows who you are or cares. One of them, I fear. What are you saying, my boy? Sometimes when I go out in the dark, I feel eyes burning like points of fire on my back, as if someone is... How could that be? I, it couldn't be. Is it my own guilt? Enough. You are guilty of nothing. 
And yet, what if... I believe in you. What's more, your sister believes in you. Aye. And she has borne more looks and sneers and worse on the streets of Cloistrum than ever you did. She is your stout defender. It's true. She writes that she's taking a few days away. Deserved too. She's faced down a dozen gossips and tattletales, to my knowledge. She fights for it. You must fight for it too, Neville. As long as I have her and you who believe in me... You're not alone. Rosa believes in you, and Mr. Grugius, the lawyer, is on your side. Or at least not on the side of John Jasper. Uh, you say the name that haunts me, that accuses me. He's hurt, in pain at the loss of his dear Ned. Perhaps he goes too far, but grief, you cannot question grief. And the answer to that grief is, is my trial and execution. This is getting morbid, Neville. There have been no proceedings. Mr. Grugius thinks the police will not bring a case. And yet the case remains open. You need a decent dinner and a bit of life around you. I know an eel pie and mash shop which will answer to our needs. Coat on. Sir, really, I... Does it look like I'm asking? Come. Now tell me that hasn't done you a deal of good. It has, Mr. Crisparkle. You are truly a professor of the art of the positive. I learned from a professor of the noble art of fisticuffs. Jack Broughton himself. The fancy's finest. Went 19 rounds toe-to-toe with a giblet pie in 33. He told me, it no use of moping, matey. I wasn't a reverend then. White needs to get a decent pie and And yet, as they walk away, the Reverend Septimus Crisparkle has an uneasy sensation, as if two points of fire are burning into his back. He catches the late train back and... Excuse me. Sir? You look like you might be able to help a buffer, Reverend. Do you need help, sir? Directions, mostly. New in town, needs a crib, don't know a crib. Be glad of a word, a place to rest a, a weary traveller's boot heels. The travellers, sir, by their station here, should answer your needs. Answers. I'm more your chap for questions. But that sounds capital if I say so myself. Which I did, didn't I? <laughs> in your debt, Reverend, in your debt. Dick Datchery at your service. Now, sir, I waste not a second, but a spring to action. And good night to you. A very peculiar fellow. And in sleepy cloisterum, the days go by and Miss Twinkleton's pupils once more depart, this time for the summer, and Rosabard is left alone, on the branch. Happy to be so until the maid enters and says that Mr Jasper awaits you, miss, in the little garden by the sundial. Oh, why, oh, why did you say I was at home, Mabel? Miss Bud, Rosa, I, uh, I have been waiting some time to be called back to my task. Task, sir? As your music teacher. <laughs> I have missed my favourite pupil. I, I have left off that. But you have so much talent. Mr. Gru just said you had left it because, well, the shock of... But really, it would be good, beneficial to... Resume. Do you see? I do not, sir. I see it as it is. Done completely. You would have done better had you loved him better. I did love him. Yes, but not quite. There was, he said, something or nothing between you. A fly, as it were, in the ointment. I don't know what you are saying, sir. I wish merely to discontinue. Merely. And I do not wish to be questioned further about it. Yes, yes, of course. Since you wish it, so shall it be. I... I would not. And if you will excuse me... A moment. I have to go. Stay. <laughs> sir, please. Your hand. I... I... I'm sorry. My emotion, Rosa. Miss Bud, please wait. Here. 
Eileen on the sundial. I will take the time, yes? Ah, do you remember? You always found tempo, the... the... Please, sit, and I will stand, sir. Very well, if I must. If love compels, you must. Sir? You loved Edwin, you say? Well, I think we loved each other in our way, my Eddie and... Your Eddie, my Ned, but yes, we loved him. Grant me that. Well, yes. That is, yes. My dear lost boy. And not to know where or if or anything at all. Could you not see? Can you not see? See what, Mr. Jasper? To love what he loved. Yes, not quite loved as love, but as sister, brother, sister. Don't you see what I'm saying, Rosa? I have no idea what you are saying. You're not slow, I know that. Can you not see that I love you as the love that he loved? You begin to frighten me, sir. We are the sole earthly remains of those who loved my boy. That is what I'm saying. This is wrong. Listen to me. As you used to, when we sat side by side at the keyboard. I never listen. Do not thwart me in this, Rosa. I will say what I have to say. This is late. I'm, I must Stay. Be- because Ned loved you, I loved you too. His delight was my delight because I loved him. Loved him? We were so much more than uncle and nephew. That was always absurd. We were best friends, and his life, his career in Egypt with you, that was the best of me. Do you see, Rose? Of all the finest things that we can do, that we can be, is to be true friends. That is where the genius of human beings lies, in true friendship. That is as true as love. We talked of it so, brother and sister. Then let us be brother and sister. Let us join ourselves in holy love of him. Make an altar to that bright spirit before which we may kneel together. Rosa... Rose, I am saying, let us love together that which we love apart. Mr. Chesper, what you say, everything you say is... Can't you see? It's, it's monstrous. He made my life something better as he did yours. Better or worse, my life is my life, sir. Love me, hate me, despise me, but give yourself to me. To Edwin, become my wife and together Ned may be born in you. I will not be consumed by you. And your friend Helena Landless. What about her? Her brother Neville. Chris Buckle told me he cared for you. A wild boy who might have done anything to get what he wanted. And if he goes down, as he may, what then for his sister? Do you threaten me? I promise you, Rosa. I hold Neville Lawless in the palm of my hand like... a spider I will crush at my will. But here... All is calm, and listen, the birds are singing. Give me a sign that you attend to me. Good. And not a word that we have met and talked today. Go away. This is our fate, our destiny. Don't cast me off, Rosa. No one and nothing may come between the three of us, and the child we must give life to. Good day to you then, Miss Bud. When the old cathedral clock chimes one, a very peculiar fellow sits down to his lunch, and a lugubrious waitress takes his order. Sir, chops, I think, mutton. Carrots, lightly done. The potatoes roasted, I believe, and the endive. Mm, the endive as it comes. Sir. A moment, if you will. Sir. I suppose a fair lodging for a single buffer might be had in the town. Sir. Something old. Old is best, I find, mostly. <laughs> old abides. Sir. If you might do me the favour of noting down some addresses. Sir. In my notebook. <laughs> Here, take a pencil. With pleasure, sir. And after lunch, out in the town, notebook in hand... Excuse me, ma'am. Am I in the way of uh, Mrs Tope, the verger's wife? And is told by a fortuitously passing lady... You are a very peculiar young man, sir. The verger lives in Cathedral Close. Where else would he live? And his wife lives there too. Which way? (sighs) That way. Our oh boy! Oh boy, stop that at once! 
Stop what, Gavna? You know... <gasps> exactly what? Throwing stones? <gasps> oh! It's a very bad habit. Come here. I'll come when you can catch me, Gov. Woody, woody, when? Stay there, then, and show me the way to Mrs Toad. Woody, woody, woo, won't show you. <laughs> Faster than you reckoned, my lethal little friend. I ain't your friend, but for a sixpence... I'll consider it if you Lego my ear. <laughs> it's a deal. Don't know as I can trust a funny-looking gove like you. Trust the money. Tastes solid enough. Woody Woody Whoop. That's Mrs. Toops. Up the steps to the. Nah, straight off the street. Up the steps is. something else. Like what? Like the bloody devil. Language? That's where Jasper lives. Ain't going near there, sixpence or not. What do they call you? Deputy. When they isn't shouting at me. Then you can be my deputy and tell me why you won't go near that bloody devil. Because he half strangled me. And when I'm bigger, I'm going to do for him with a bloody great rock. But not today. Not today. <laughs> I like you, deputy. Stay in touch and I think we can do business. Ha! With you and old Durdles, I'll soon be a bloody corporation. That's the 19th century for you, deputy. Here, one thing. Yes? Is that your own hair? Because it looks like a sheep got shorn and they stuck it on your noodle. So what do you see when you see me? I seized that air, didn't I? So, you learnt something useful today, my friend. It's what conjurers call misdirection. Now, let's get to it. At last, he takes a rest from the endless readings. We spend time in the country, near the sea, though I am never sure how deeply he cares for hedgerows and woods. His heart seems set on cities and narrow alleys and hidden courts and attics and byways and hideaways. And I say to him, Father, now you will have more time for your novel, for Edwin and Rosa and... He holds up his hand to stop me and says, Why do you think I ceaselessly work, if not to put off, put aside? And his hand is trembling. The end of the journey. Cab! Cabby! Please! Uh, what's up, miss? You wanting an answer? A cab, yes, please, if I may. Well, answer is as answer does it, and you may if you can pay. Actually, for you, even if you can't. Hop aboard, let me lower the gangplank. And me, uh, Napoleon, will convey you to your destination. <sighs> Napoleon, sir. Yeah, me horse, on account of his short, knows his own mind and suffers something chronic, like the Emperor, from wind. Uh, where to? I'm not quite sure. It's, uh, the only address I have is Hiram Brugis, Esquire, Staple in London. Oh, he'd be your man in London, then. Hey. <laughs> oh, I do beg your pardon, miss. It's all right. I thought it was the horse. Legal sort, is he, your man? Uh, yes. Oh, no sooner said than done. Bony! <laughs> now, Septimus, is it to be push ups or shadow boxing this morning? Is someone throwing? Come out, I say. Show yourself, or it'll be a right fist to the nose, my friend. I ain't hiding. I'm right here, ain't I? I didn't see you, lad. Neither did you, Jack Crib. I'll throw about a fisty cuffs, is we? Up, 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 and he's done! Look like you could do with some building up yourself, my boy. What do you want? How does you know I want anything? Because you've been watching me this quarter of an hour. He was lying about... Not seeing you? Yes. Bad habit in a wicker. I got a message. Go on. From a party, what says? <clears throat> Rosa hopped it, left no state in respects, and has gone post haste to London for. It is impossible that I may stay here ever again in this here life. London, you say? 
What party? I did. And a party what remains a non... a non... Yeah, Imus. Yeah. Uh, where in London? Do I look like a bloody gazetteer? Nah, my party says, get your skates on and go. Staples in, and if I ain't mistaken, that there brass plate by that there door says Ira McGrugis, second floor. Thank you, sir. You're very kind. God bless me, my dear, if it ain't a pleasure. And good luck, young lady. Oh, oh. Mr. Crugis! Rosa, my dear child, I. Let me sit. Oh, I was... I thought... There, coming out of the dark, I thought it was your mother. Your dear, dear... She has been much in my thoughts these last months, but... But... but sit, sit down. What is... How do you come to be here? <laughs> what has happened? Something... Monstrous. I hardly know myself. <laughs> Mr. Jasper. He has forced his attentions upon me in the most odious way. <laughs> Damn him. Confound his politics, frustrate his knavish tricks, on you his claws to fix. Double damn him. Are you sure you're all right, Mr. Grugis? Compose yourself, Grugis. You are a man of the law, not some... Rosa, I shall send to the hotel across the way for some tea. You will excuse me, my clerk is not here. A moment. Be reassured, my dear, you have come to a calm anchorage. And he is gone. And Rosa understands that Mr. Grugius has given her the time to come to herself. And she is determined that this shall be done. No more flippity gibbet. No more apron over the head. Hey! Deputy, my lad! Ain't your lad, Mr. Muttonhead? And I could say it as I ain't Mr. and Muttonhead. Walk with me a while if you've the time. Some of us has jobs to go to. We ain't in the business of swanning around town disporting ourselves. At our leisure. You delivered my... Of course I did. I said you could depend on deputy. So, how many jobs hmm? do you have? Ain't none of your business. Two. Messenger and occasional boots at the inn. And stoning dirdles. Dirdles being? In the graveyard most night, drunk as a dray horse. Less than someone drives him home to his missus. And that'd be you? Duh. Yes. And Mr Dirdles is the stone mason. I don't answer that, I know he is. Ow. <laughs> Asking around. Lousy bugger, ain't ya? Three pence and I'll show you. What did I say the other day when we met? About me being your deputy, like? Shilling a day wages and you get to keep your other jobs. Mr Muttonhead, you have... My name's Dick Datchery. What's yours? Dep. Winks. That's for you and no one else. Cos there ain't no other Winkses in this world except me. <laughs> Righto, Winks. Let's spring to and see Mr. Durdles. Righto. Dick, follow me. Shall I pour? Please. I'm only sorry to be so slow. Mr. Bazard would have been faster. Mr. Bazard? My clerk. Well, he favours me with his presence, taking time off from his vocation as a great dramatist. He writes plays? Tragedies, mostly. The tragedy being that no one puts them on. Yet he keeps on scribble, scribble. Heroic, really. Poor man. Are they uh, any good? I have only read the one. His great work, The Thorn of Anxiety. And? It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to see. Laughter in your eyes. I do feel better. Now, perhaps we can approach what you have to say. Before I do, sir, may I ask a question first? Of course, my dear. Helena, 
Miss Landless told me her brother Neville is lodged close to your chambers. You and the Reverend arranged it to ensure he was not alone, that he was safe. Aye, along the street, on the corner. You can see it from my window. Is he safe still, today, now? Is he safe? Good day, Durdles. Deputy, who's the white with the hair? That's Dick, that is. That tree. At your service, Mr Durdles. Nice monument. Well, all the same to me. Well, what can I do for you? My deputy here tells me he was on the job Christmas Eve. That is stoning part of it. A little celebratory tipple, as you might say. A bottle... Around about nine o'clock? All three, come to think of it. Come half past ten, I was even rocks to get him on the move. And did you, by a chance, see two young fellows leaving the building there? The road is in clear view from here, I believe. Aye, uh, I did. And what sort of spirits were they in? Um, let me think. Come on, Durdles, we were standing here. Yes, yeah, uh, they's <laughs> laughing about something or other. And I'm, uh, Merry Christmas, gents, but they're chatting like young fellas do. Storm coming up. That's it, you got it. And, and, and he's saying, one of them... Or, Wind's worse than Jack when he gets on his high horse. <laughs> and the other, he's laughing. Uh, I'll not hold you to it if you need to get back, Edwin. No worry, old man. We'll see the weir. It'll help me clear my mind for what's coming. And then... Go on. I fell over. And that's where I found him snoring like a Ramshire hog. Only before I went off... I thought there was someone else following, following. And has anybody questioned you about that night? No, not a word. Thank you, Mr Durdles. I think some lunch and then we shall take a look at the weir, winks my friend. Another cab, another visitor. It's a busy day in Fettles Inn. This one no less frantic than the first. The Reverend C. throws himself out of the cab and... Not here. Gracious Lord, what now? Calm yourself, Reverend. I take it you refer to Miss Bud. Where is she, man? Is she safe? She is. Installed in the best room they have to offer at the inn over the way. She is comfortable and relaxed. Thank the Lord for that. But her flight's so precipitate. It is impossible that I may stay here ever again in this life. What can she mean? Can I order tea for you, Reverend? After what? Your... Uh, no, Goodness. perhaps not. Well, may I ask how you left Mr. Jasper in Cloisterham? Is Jasper somehow the cause? Has he, as you might say, been around the place? About the cathedral? Why do you ask? Come, stand by me at the window here in the shade of the drape and observe the street. The teeming life of the metropolis where any man might pass unseen. Yes, it's busy. Lift your eyes from the street. The house there, thin and narrow, second floor left, first window. Dusty, but... uh... Yes? You'll see an individual who you might recognize as our local friend. John Jasper. And what might you suppose our local friend, on his occasional visits, is up to? From that window, as from yours, one might see Neville's attic balcony. And scan the streets and... And wait and... follow. Holy God, Grugius. Neville is... Safe for now. But Miss Bud, in the hotel over the way... I have had occasion in the course of my business, Reverend, to have done a service or two for a certain gentleman of a less than saintly persuasion. At this moment, my bulldogs watch over both the young people. I think it will be best for Miss Bud to move in the morning, but I believe Neville will be safe for now. If you tip him the wink, as it were. This is where it all come down, innit? What did? 
the horrible murder. In them deep waters, what isn't never going to give up their grisly secrets? Really? It was in the paper what the porter read to me. Grisly and unknown depths. Is that what you think? Oh, I think octopus done it. What come out to see? Well, they have octopus where I come from, but I don't think they inhabit the English Channel somehow. Well, that's what you know, Clever Dick, but Winks knows different. <sighs> to you indeed. Winks knows what he knows. That's philosophy, my friend. What about criminal detection? What do you know? I know what you wants to know. You wants to know about a watch and a ring. He insists on continuing the readings. But his friends, his family, say no more. For your health, for us, for the book. I tell him I am gripped by this story, avid to know the truth of it, to find the solution to the crime. And he looks at me, and his eyes are burning, and he says, Can you not see, Kate? It isn't about solving anything. It's about hiding the crime. And standing solitary by the cloister and weir, John Jasper, a man of great sorrow and and acquainted with grief. Sir, you have a fine voice. I I, I thought I was alone. I I apologise. No need to apologise for bringing beauty into the world. We have not met Richard Datchery, antiquarian. Uh, John Jasper, choir master. My stock in trade, snooping around old places and ancient monuments, ferreting out the truth of the matter. I wonder if too much learning makes us sour, Mr. Datchery. You'll excuse me, I have the London train to catch. Ooh, of course. <laughs> I have enjoyed our little chat. I hope we shall meet again. I shall stay beside the river. Ever changing, ever the same. What did you say? The river. (laughs) Sir, it is the same and yet different, is it not? Are you alone? It's you. Are you surprised? Oh, I'll never see you again, dearie. Thought you was dead and gone to heaven. Why would you think that? What? Because I'd never thought you could keep away from the lady. What makes is the real thing, not your cheap dreams. Shall I mix a pipe? Or two? Do you think I'm here for your company? Been trying to mix it yourself, have you, Poppy? Mm, now and then in my own way. Oh, leave it to the princess. She knows how you like it. You ain't a beginner anymore. She's your wife. <laughs> And your life now, the Lady Poppy. (laughs) It's a time for visitors. Welcome or not so welcome. Gracious. Sounds like the spirit of Mr. Bazard's fifth act in Numo. Come in. Ah, Mr. Landless. You are out and... About? (laughs) Yes, sir. The Reverend has warned you. Of a skulking fellow, as he put it, who will not make me skulk, I can assure you. I would like it better if you could assure me of your safety. Here I stand, as you see me. Do I also see, perhaps, if I may take my analogy from a playwriting gentleman, a thorn of discontent? (laughs) And yet the thorn still pricks, as Mr. Bassett would have it. So let us have it out, Mr. Neville. Very well, sir. The Reverend, you, my sister, Miss Bud, have all given me hope against hope, and to all of them I have offered my heartfelt gratitude. Except Miss Bud. Mr. Chris Sparkle has told me she is in London, was even nearby for a time, and yet I was denied the chance to see her. Why, sir? Why? It was for her own protection. That shadow that followed you could have attached itself. 
And, and now she has moved to the suburbs. Miss Twinkleton is her chaperone and she is still denied to me. To protect her, sir. By what right, Mr. Grugis, do you take that duty upon yourself? She is a young woman who must take the decision upon herself. The right of love, Mr. Neville. I was not always the dry stick of a man you see before you, worn away like the faded ink of old documents. I was a young man, with a friend. We were inseparable. Young men together who both loved the most. She chose my friend, and they were happy, and there was a child, and then she died. I could not save her. I could only bury her. Then he died and consigned their daughter in future marriage to the son of another friend. It was an infamous deed and I connived in it as solicitor. Well, that is not to be. One half of that deed is now dead. I do not want to have to bury Rosa. Mr. Grugis, look at me. I am a young man, as you were once. I am in love, as you were once. Will you consign me, yet another prisoner of the past? Or will you free us both? Sit quiet, whilst I does the job, and soon enough you'll be wherever you wish to be. There's something I have to tell you. If... If there was something you were going to do... Going to do? Mm. Got to do. Go away. For good. For good. You wanted to do. To tell someone. Yes, dearie, I'm listening. Do you understand me, Jack? Go away. 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 Never come back. Many times. Never. 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 Tell me. Forever and forever. Over an abyss where one misstep. What does it matter to you? As long as I pay as well or better. Here. Something to regret. Enough. Get out of my way. It's later than I thought. Did I not tell you to wake me? You said nothing, dearie. Not a word. It was like he was already dead. Perhaps, or perhaps your brain is so addled you can't think straight anymore. I'll not see you again. That's what you said last time, Poppy. But this time you won't escape the princess. Oh no, my darling dear. I'll have your number this time. Won't I just... And she follows in his footsteps. A tattered shadow. Miss Bud. Mr. Landless, what are you doing here? I had to see you. Mr. Gru just gave me your address. Well, he had no right. He should have asked me first. And what would you have said? No, I would have forbidden it. Why? May I ask? Don't answer if you don't care to, but at least for Helena's sake... Is she back from her holiday? She's... Who knows where she is? I haven't seen her. Miss Bud, I, I realise there is no reason on this earth why you should talk with me. Why you shouldn't simply say, go. And I will go. But Helena tells me you believe that I am innocent of this crime, this mystery, and for that alone I am forever in your debt. When I look at you I see another world, Mr. Landless. And is it a world in which we two might be friends, Miss Bud? I think 
perhaps? All tickets, all tickets from London, please. Ah, uh, good evening, Mr. Jasper. Was you on business in the smoke? Indeed, Mr. Willett, but glad to be back. I trust you'll be at choir practice tonight. We need all our bases for lasses. Uh, indeed, sir, I will. If you please, sir, who was the fine gent you was talking to? Oh, that's Mr. Jasper, dear. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Your own product, John Chinaman told me. And I should have listened. <laughs> Listen to who? Eh? What? Get away. Get away. What do you want with me? I think it's more like what do you want, ma'am? Or who? And who are you to be asking? <laughs> My name's Dick Datchery. And you just happens to be hanging around, Dick Datchery. I'm an antiquary, interested in ancient things. <laughs> <laughs> then I should be right up your lane, my dear. On my travels, there ain't much I ain't seen. From the crucifixion of our Lord to the gent who just come by. Mr. John Jasper. As a calling. Choir master at the cathedral. <laughs> oh, now I've seen it all, I not just. <laughs> I was here once before. Last Christmas time it was. Kind gent then gave me three shilling and sixpence. Maybe you'll be as kind, sir. <laughs> Bit cool to name the sum, ain't it? Ah, it's what I need for what I'm dealing. My medicine. I like to know what I'm buying. Poppy, darling, poppy. Opium. And information. Go on. With a sight more than three and six. <laughs> you think? To an antiquary like you. <laughs> mm, go on. Your choir master. Mr. John Jasper. Medicine? Medicine. Why should I be interested in that? Because there's three folk in this little transaction and only one of them is genuine coin, and that's me. Five shillings, I should say. How long do you stay in the town? Thank you, Poppet. And I think I'll stay as long as I'm here. <laughs> Princess Puffer, Mr. Dick. That's me name. For a widow. You. That's right, Poppy. Me. Your old princess. What in the name of God are you doing here? You ain't a stupid man, John Jasper. I know's that for a fact. What do you bloody think I'm doing here? I can't see you now. I have meetings. That's all right, dearie. Later is perfect. Give you time to go to your bank and draw out a hundred pound on account of what I might have heard when you was in dreamland. Notes, please. At my age, the weight of coin is a, a bother. Very well. At nine tonight, there, by the little door. Not here, in the crypt. If I'm buying your silence, I want to have silence. Locked. I have a key. Come. Come, I have what you want. Come. We had a conversation a few days before, before, and he said, I wish I'd been a better father. He spoke of things we'd, we'd never spoken of before. The new words rang loudly on the silence between us and they were of an honesty and truth 
that I will, can, never share. That evening, he felt a little unwell and my sister asked if he would sit down and he said, open the window, and she did. And she said he looked ill and perhaps he should lay down and he said, yes, on the ground. The streets look so far away from up here. It is an attic, sir. It's very high. There are... More flights of stairs than is conscionable in a house. My sister once climbed a main mast, Mr. Grugis, and occupied the crow's nest. Crow's nests are all very well for crows and sailors, and I dare say for dashing young women of your sister's temper, but otherwise, best left alone. However, since you mention Miss Helena, might one inquire as to her whereabouts? She seems to have gone missing. I can only say, sir, that she has, in the past, taken it into her head to go away. In Ceylon, she would venture into the forests. I would go too, but the impulse was hers, the plan was hers, though the punishment was shared between us. She is a headstrong young woman. Well, none the worse for it, though I had hoped she might lend her voice to mine. How so, sir? I have been talking to Miss Bud. <laughs> you have been talking to Miss Bud. I never went behind your back. You knew of it, Mr. Grugis. You gave it, I believe, your approval. Calm yourself, my young friend. Indeed, I did. Within boundaries and without prejudice, as we say in the legal business. I'm not in the legal business. But this conversation you had? We were in a boat, sir, on the Thames. It was all quite proper. It is so much quieter than the water at Cloister. <sighs> but it finds its way to the sea from the same reaches as that damned Veer pool. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> Miss Twinkleton would say, Girls, there is never any excuse for intemperate language. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I think I would like my language to be very intemperate indeed. I remember Helena saying something very much the same. <laughs> and then saying something very intemperate indeed. <laughs> I wish you would ask her to come and visit me. When I was with her... It was as if I could see further, more clearly things I had not seen before. You were not able to tell... Uh... Eddie? No, how could I? We were... With no more, we were friends. Best friends. Miss Bud, Rosa, I... No, hush, don't say a word, let me. I sometimes used to think that for all that friendship... The love that Eddie had within him was for his uncle. He honoured him above. Do you see? I could not ever speak against him in front of Eddie. He simply would not have heard anything against. John Jasper. Helena used to talk about the leopards in the forest of your salon. Elegant, she said, almost fastidious in the way they hunted. That is how he looked at me. How on that last time by the sundial, how he looked at me then. As if he might tear me to pieces in some dreadful celebration of monstrous love. I don't know. You never told me that man had been infamous to Miss Bud. I did not. And yet you told me he haunts these streets in the same city where she walks. Is it beyond him to search out where she lives? Miss Bud is protected. I have seen to that. She is safe. And I say she is not. Not whilst that man walks the earth. John Jasper says very much the same about you. As if you might be two sides of a single... Dad, no. I will not listen. You will listen to this, my young friend. Stay put. The law is not finished with this case. Do not prove yourself a man capable of violence and anger. Be temperate, and all will come out in time. Let me give you a hand, Reverend. Why, thank you. Your towel? A fine day for a swim. 
the warmth of the sun. I uh, swim every day, sir, if I have the opportunity. Sometimes my duties. Uh... Have we met? There's something familiar. At the station the other night, you were so kind as to direct me to an hotel. Datchery, Dick Datchery. Ah, I remember now, Mr. Datchery. <laughs> How are you enjoying your visit to our town? Fascinating old place, Reverend. Full of mysteries. And not all of them ancient. Not sure I catch your meaning, sir. A mystery that you yourself are a part of. Say what you have to say. I have duties that call on me. That day, following the disappearance of Mr. Edwin Drood, you swam here in the river by the weir. You found something. A ring. A repeating watch. How do you know these things? That much is in evidence, sir, and may be read by any interested person. <laughs> I also have a witness. You say so? Young eyes. Now, this watch repeated the last chime, half past nine. You said you found it in the water, but surely that is unlikely. I certainly did. Mm. I remember, clearly. It was deep. It was icy. So cold, I was... Uh... If you can hold the rope, Joe, I can swim. In your mind's eye, see it again. Ask nothing, only observe. You were with Mr. Joe. I'm diving! If I'm not up after a count of 200, pull like hell! Like the devil, Wigger. <laughs> what? Ten. Oh, bless me, he ain't never coming up. Haul away, Joe. Haul for your life. Help! Help me, Joe! Help me! Help! You don't remember coming up? I was drowning. Joe saved me. I, I was half frozen. I was... Starved of oxygen. So you don't remember. But I had the watch. The ring. They must have been in the river. But where else? Obviously. You were swimming. You had them. They must have been... But what if they were never in the water, but, say, on the pylons? On the causeway, on the concrete, where it rises clear of the water. I... Uh, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Somewhere they were meant to be seen. Oh, where that very cunning repeater watch could be set to repeat a vital time and would not be ruined by the water. Oh, Miss Bud. Rosa, come, 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 come. I was reading Mr. Bazard's tragedy, The Rewrites. I have finished it. It was nip and tuck as to which finished who first, it or me, but... You were concerned. I am, sir. I was to meet Neville Landless today. You know we went on the river. I do. You told him what happened with a certain gentleman. Not all. Not much, perhaps, but enough. I said it was unwise. I thought I owed him the truth. I felt he deserved to know. But I wonder now if... What has happened? He never came this morning. I waited long past the time. Then a note was delivered. From Mr. Neville? May I? I will read it to you, if I may. Dear... Forgive me for not being... I hate to break a promise, but certain matters have been preying on my mind. You were used infamously by that beast. I promised that good man, Chris Sparkle, to master my own feelings of anger and resentment. I hold myself to little account, but you... 
I hold far higher. I care not for myself, but for you. This is a serious matter, Rosa. We must go to him now. You will not find him. The attic room is empty. I fear he has returned to Cloisterham, Mr. Grugis. Then I will go there at once. I shall call a cab to take you... I shall come with you. Don't you see, Rosa? It's impossible. He goes in my behalf to commit some desperate act. All my life I have been treated as something precious, to be protected and cared for. Well, it's time to climb the main mast and occupy the crow's nest, Mr. Grugis. for you. What was she doing? Looking for the octopus? The old woman, where is she? I was going to ask you the same thing, Captain. I ain't seen her. Not nowhere after I last seen her. Where? Last night. Graveyard with the devil. John Jasper. That's what I said. They come through late-ish. Durdle's time. Then goes in one of them doors and didn't come out. <sighs> you should have followed them. Door locked. No key. Blast! But I know who has. Mr. Durdle's the mason. Oh, I can get it tonight. I'll meet you at ten in the graveyard. First, there's a letter I want you to deliver. You know the place. Wink showed you, Captain. Later. Boo! <coughs> <coughs> easy, Dick. Only me. Uh, you've got it? Of course I have. Durdle's is easy. Here. And the other matter. As he wanted. Right. Let's go. Anything? Smells. Oh, it's old. Damp. Perfume. Cheap. How would you know that, Wix? Trust me, Dick. It's cheap. <laughs> you never cease to surprise. Ah, uh, and that's lime. And that's a body. <gasps> Princess Puffer. Poor woman, a terrible place to die alone. I only... doubt she croaked on her own some dick. Someone got his hooks round her. <coughs> Blimey. She's alive. Murder. Murder. Landless returns to Cloisterham. Well, now it comes to it. Where it all began. We see what you're made of. And where it must all come to its end. And thus, all must come together on this night. Septimus Crisparkle returns home to find... Rosa? Remember last Christmas, when we were all together, singing, playing. However do you come to be here? What is it? What happened? Mr. Grugis, in London at the station, he said it was the strain, his heart. Not... No. He is weak, but being looked after. He said it was the thorn of anxiety that got him at last. Then why are you here and not with him? He wouldn't let me stay. He knew how important it was. Well, we sent a telegram from London to Helena. I don't understand, Rosa. To save a life. To save two lives. What are you saying? No one knows where he is. Neville. I fear he has murder on his mind. Well, Dick, you said it was urgent. I got a message from London. <laughs> it seems the game is a foot mix. Then best we get to it. You know what you have to do? I do. Uh, if something goes wrong, we improvise. If I need to leave a note, can you read? Yes. No. Draw a picture. You. May I come in? 
Yes, of course. <sighs> Here, dry yourself. I have warm punch. Yeah, no matter. I am. Please oblige me this. Let me offer you what small hospitality I can. Very well. I will accept your hospitality, sir. For now. That's all I ask, young man. I'll not offer a toast. I don't think you can accept one from me. Do you blame me for that, Mr. Jasper? Not for a moment. Mm. You've come from London? As you must be aware. Your friends will be concerned. Uh, they don't know. Ah. She hates you, you know. Oh, I see. At last you come out with it. She thinks you monstrous. In the garden, the, the sundial, the things you said. Please, oblige me. What did I say? Uh, uh, she did not, uh, could not bear to... Uh, recall? Uh, yes, recall. And you shall answer... I am trying, but you seem confused. You will answer, I swear. You, you insult... Insulted. And yet you say you do not act on her behalf. Your lying words. Remind me, what words? The words you never heard? Her word is sacred. Her beauty, her goodness. Oh, enough of this flim flab. Sugar and spice. May I read you something? I'm sure you'll find it interesting. I am not yet. Not yet. I, I will not. I, 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 I. By the way, it's the poppy. Opium in the punch. Obviously, you're not used to it. It will help you relax and listen, and yet not sleep. <laughs> this isn't... No, it's not right, it's... Listen. Edwin is murdered. I now swear and record the oath on this page that I will never more discuss this mystery with any human creature until I fasten the crime of the murder of my dear dead boy upon the murderer and that I shall devote myself to his destruction. I shall stand upon the tower of my righteousness and cast down the guilty one. <laughs> you are insane. But come, Neville. You are interested in things, are you not? The cathedral tower. I'm sure you'd love to see it. There's a fine view. Why, old Durdle says, on a clear night, you can almost see heaven. <laughs> Come. Let me help you. <clears throat> Come. Come. Oh, hurry. I fear the worst. Have faith, Miss Bud. We shall prevail. Jasper, we must see you. Come on, sir, come on! Gone away! Jasper! Mr. Jasper! Nothing here. Is there any message? Any... Uh? Rosa! Mr. Datchery, what are you... The same mission as you, it seems. Looking for Mr. Jasper uh, and... Uh... Your brother! What? Who? I'm afraid the rain hasn't done much for my hair. <clears throat> or the rest of my costume. Helena, I would have known you anywhere. Oh, my dear, my dear. <laughs> yeah, for what on earth? Yeah, who exactly? Mr. Da... Ah, Miss... Oh, this is confusing. No time to waste, Reverend. A wet coat. Neville's coat. He was here. But where now? Uh, give me that glass. <laughs> Opium. How do you... Salon, the smell was... <gasps> ah, his diary. I fear you are right, Rosa. A oh, horror. Where would they go? Where? The where? Too obvious. Ah, listen. I shall devote myself to his destruction. I shall stand upon the tower of my righteousness and cast down the guilty one. <gasps> The cathedral tower. Of course. Where else? But it'll be locked. I have a key. And I need paper. I have to draw a picture. Well, here we are, Mr. Landless. Can I not promise you a fine view? The rain has stopped for us. Let me go, damn you. Oh, I shall have no fear. Soon enough, my boy, soon enough. Here. 
come to the window, it'll freshen you up. Why? Why what? Why did you do it? I did nothing. You murdered him. No, you don't understand at all. I've been dreaming of something, do you see? For years. Since Ned was... Since we were boys together. Well, such hopes I had. And then, when... Oh, hold. I fear we're to be interrupted. Why? Why? Tell me why. Because of her. Because Rosa gave me hope. I gave you nothing. I despise you. Well, Mr. Jasper, here we are again. Mr. Datchery, a surprise, but perhaps not a very great one. Mm. You would oblige me by allowing me to help my brother. He can do you no good now. I meant him no harm. He has a small part to play, that's all. Reverend, if you will. Of course. Neville, my boy. Here, take my arm. He murdered Drood. Opium. Oh, Let me help you. He'll get over it. How could I have a part in this? What did I do? I gave you no hope. Oh, you wouldn't understand. Chris Barkle, you should take her away. The boy too. All of you, go. Leave me. Not yet. But you're right. Reverend, please take Rosa and my brother. Helena, be careful. He is not to be trusted. What now? We wait. For what? Were you really going to kill my brother? To protect my secret. The murder of Edwin Drood? That was an accident. No secret. Then tell me what is. Why should you know it? What right do you have to that? You loved him. He was my... Not as your nephew. You loved him as I love Rosa. You told him as I will never tell her. You think not? Love is a very great power, Miss Landless, and we are helpless before it. Perhaps you'll learn that one day. Or perhaps I will kill the thing I love, as you did. You followed them that night to the weir, didn't you? I thought the night, the stars... And he told me what I most wanted to know. Rosa had freed him. I was foolish, perhaps, but I told him of my feelings, my love for him. The love I had always held. He said, of course, old chap, we are the best of... I took hold of him. I shook him, tried to make him understand. I kissed him. He was... horrified. He struck out. I begged. He slipped on the mud and struck his head. He did not move. What had I done? Killed him? By accident, yes, but what came next you did in full knowledge. I had killed the one I loved. And so the story against Neville Landless, the watch, the ring, left where they would be easily found. Since then, I've been in hell. You could not admit to it? If I told the truth, what would the world have done, Miss Landless? Branded me a monster, not because of his death, but because of my love. Why should that love be a sin? Why? There is no sin in love, Jasper. Whatever the world says. But in placing the blame on another... But don't you think I haven't been hunted through these months by the hound of hell? In London, I followed the boy, never knowing if I should confess to him or kill him. Ah, this is what we are waiting for. He didn't die, you know. Your Edwin. He was badly hurt, very badly. And yet he crawled from the water and lived. Oh, something happened to his mind. He didn't know where he was, who he was. He was found, cared for. 
by strangers and found again. Danny! I've got your picture! By my assistant. The urchin. I should have strangled him when I had the chance. But I knew somehow he was part of this. Part of my end. Here's your octopus dick, Mr. Edwin Drews. There was no death, no crime. There he stands. You really haven't understood anything, have you? And he turned away and fell, and lay broken on the ground. John Jasper had murdered himself, as he always intended. He wanted to be buried in Cloisterham, my father, to lie in the cathedral there. He knew, I'm sure, that this was his last journey. The journey that has only one end. <laughs>